Sarah, for that beautiful song. God is good. Well, it's good to see each and every one out this morning. Those that are joining us on the internet, I also say welcome to you. And it's good to have a few visitors. It's good to have Megan Durst here. And then I believe also Sister Elizabeth. Uh, This is your family from Cayman. Well, it's good to have them here this morning also. And it's wonderful that they would travel all this way to hear me preach. I probably not. It might be for the snow. They wanted to see some of that snow. They don't get much snow down there, do they? No. We'll send it back with you then. Well, it's good to have you this morning. And let me say, also say it's good to see Dr. Fry this morning. Amen. I heard at least one amen. He was supposed to be somewhere else this morning, but God sometimes changes our plans. And sometimes we don't understand why God sometimes works the way he does. But I'm thankful to say that God always um, has things worked out for the perfect for us. Well, this morning, before I get into my sermon, you may be wondering, where in the world do preachers get their messages from? How in the world do they decide what they're going to preach? Can I tell you a little secret? Sometimes where we get our sermons is where God is working on our own lives. When God begins to talk with us about things within ourselves is sometimes where we get our sermons. And this morning, this sermon is something that God has been working on me in my own life. Um, I would like to start off, if you don't mind, with just a little story to share with you. In September 1995, Carly and Charlie Harvey answered an early morning knock upon their front door. Two policemen stood there grimly, passing the terrible news that their 20-year-old son, Chad, had been found murdered. Grief-stricken, they went through the motions of the funeral, and to be honest, just through the motions of life. But as Christmas approached, Carly found herself giving vent to her disappointment and anger with God. He had failed her. Why hadn't he protected her son? After all, she had prayed for him. In desperation, she prayed, God, if you care about me, I need a miracle. Otherwise, I think I'll probably just die. And she waited. And that Christmas miracle came. One night, their doorbell rang, and when Carly's 13-year-old daughter answered it, she found a gift setting on their front steps. There was no marking, and there was no person there. No way to identify who had left this gift. The gift was a little strange to look at. It was a tree branch with some apples stuck to it. And also stuck to it was a blue plastic nightingale perched on top. And attached to it was a piece of paper which read, On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. Well, we couldn't find a partridge, and our pear tree died, so we settled to give you a bluebird on an apple branch. And also attached was a scripture verse. The next evening, there was another ring at the door and another gift. Though they raced to the door, they still were not fast enough to discover who the giver was. This time in a box was a box of chocolate turtles, candies, and two dove candy bars, and a note that on the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two turtle doves and another Bible verse. And on it went. On the third day, there were three Cornish hens. You see, the French hens did not get their passports. The fourth day, there was a cassette tape with songs which had the word bird in the title and a calling card for four calling birds. On the fifth day, there were golden rings where freshly baked donuts. On the sixth day, six geese laying were plastic chalk eggs. The seventh day was swans swimming across the top of a blue frosted cake. Eight maids of milking, there was a cow candle. On the ninth day, nine ladies dancing, there was eight gingerbread people dancing. You see, the Equal Opportunity Act would not allow just ladies to come. The tenth, there were ten wooden leaping puppets. Eleventh, there was a tape of pipers piping. And on the twelfth day, there was twelve biscuits. I still look like little drums. Each day had a Bible verse. 
Carly found that this was her miracle. For the first time since Chad's death, she had begun to look forward to the next day, wanting to know what would come next. Thinking at that time, she says, my miracle. When I couldn't talk to God, when I didn't even want to talk to him, he sent a miracle through someone else. God used earthly hands to send it to me, but his fingerprints were all over it. Carly's experience reminds us that when people are wounded, broken, and hurting, our actions can be a miracle to them, helping them find healing and recovery. Indeed, often like Carly, they are unable to speak to God, but we can become a vehicle of God's grace to them. This morning I want to talk to us, church, and this is to all of us. There is not a person in this church that is excluded this morning. And that is, I believe, that God has called us, church, to be servants and to serve one another. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read in Luke chapter 10. It was just a matter of a few weeks ago, I believe, that I preached from the same but I want us to look again because I believe that God has the ingredients and the steps for us to follow to be servants. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 20. Just a moment. Five. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How read you it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, as a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him pass on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. And I'd like for us just to read just one verse over in John chapter 12, verse 26. We read these words. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And wherever I am, there will my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This morning, I want to take just a few minutes and look at this thought of servanthood. You know, many of us struggle with this thought of servant. I mean, we all love to be served, right? We like people to serve us. We like people to pamper us. We like people to take care of us. But the thought of being a servant? But Jesus has commanded us to serve and to be called into servanthood. A few years ago, my wife and I were doing a VBS theme, and we, we were talking about God's kingdom. And as I studied and prepared for this VBS, I came to the realization, church, that we are one of two people. We are one of two people in this world. We are either a servant of the Lord's, or we are a slave to the devil. There is no in-between. There is nowhere walking, trying down the middle and straddling that. It doesn't work. We are either a servant of the Lord or a slave to the devil. And you know, God has called us to serve him. And when we serve him, church, we will serve other people. 
The text tells us that if anyone serves me, he says, then our Father, his, our Father will honor us. And when we serve others, the scriptures tell us, fairly I say unto you, and as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brother, you have done it unto me. This morning, as we look at one of the most familiar stories in the New Testament, we read the story of the Good Samaritan. We read about a young man who was a lawyer. He knew the law. He knew the law. He could even quote the law. But you know, he was really putting Jesus to the test. He knew what the law said, but what he was really trying to say is, is, Lord, I know that I'm supposed to love you with all my heart and with all my soul, and I'm supposed to also to love my neighbor. But who is my neighbor? You know, I really think what he was trying to say is, can we narrow this down so my neighbor is those people that are more like me, that I feel comfortable with, Lord? That is kind of looks, dressed like me, talks like me, looks like me. Lord, isn't that good enough to have a neighbor like that? But Jesus said, no, I want to show you really what it means. I want you to really see what I mean when I talk about serving. And church, I believe this morning through this story, he has given us five requirements. Five requirements for serving other people. And I do not care who you are this morning. I want to talk to our kids. I want to talk to our young people. I want to talk to our young married couples. I want to talk to us middle-aged people. Amen. I want to talk to you, you older people this morning. Because you know what? There is not a single one of us that have been excluded. There, you know what this thing of service is? There is no age of retirement. I want to tell you. And I think of some of the greatest servants in this church this morning and who they are. And many of them are sometimes some of our oldest people that give the greatest. I think of Marnita. You know, I think she just had a birthday. And she doesn't start collecting Social Security on serving the Lord. There's a different benefit we're putting up, church. But I think of Marnita. If there's someone that could serve other people, and the, and the lady is on a limited income and has limited ability, but she'll give and she'll serve people to the best of her abilities. And I could go on and on and on and on and on, but church, there is a place for each and every one of us to serve. And I believe that there are five requirements for serving other people. The first thing I believe that, it, that this scripture tells us is that we must be conscious. Now, y'all, I'm not referring to just being awake and being alert. John Huffer, you may have to be awake. But if we are going to serve other people, we must be conscious of those around us. You know, in this story, it's interesting. All three of these people, the Levite, the priest, and the Samaritan were all conscious of that man that was laying on the side of the road. Church, if we are going to serve other peoples, we've got to be conscious of what is going on around us. What is happening? What is going on? You know, the one thing, I, as I was studying, it's an interesting thing I noticed. I wonder if Jesus did this purposefully, but he said there were, he used three men. And you know, we men sometimes have a hard time being conscious of things around us. I didn't hear any amens from you wives. Our wives will walk out with a new dress or fix their hair different or something. And if we are not conscious, we quickly find out. And I thought about this man, had he used three women, would it have been a different story? They would have probably picked the guy up, cleaned his clothes, told him where to get the best things to get stains out of his clothes, and, and fixed him a three-course meal, and kind of, you know, they would have probably been a whole lot more conscious. Women are oftentimes more conscious about things than men. It's reality. But women are conscious about certain things, but sometimes they can be just as guilty, too. Amen. <laughs> and since I did pick on the men with the hair and the dress and things like that. Um, sometimes the women with, you know, my car is broken on the side of the road. I heard this beat. 
I just thought it was the music. <laughs> this little thing was flashing on my dash. I thought it was just to the beat to the music. No, 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 no. You know, we're all guilty of sometimes not being conscious to things around us. But if we are going to serve others, church, we've got to be conscious of what is going on around us. We've got to be conscious of what's going on in the four walls of this church, but we've also got to be conscious of what's going on in our community. You know that our community is suffering from an epidemic right now with drug abuse. Frankfurt, little Frankfurt people have a hard time thinking of how severe the problem is in our community. Church, we've got to be conscious of what is going on. You know, it's oftentimes easy to be conscious about physical needs and what people's physical needs are. It's easy to look when, when we've ministered with kids and saw someone walk in with, with, with no shoes or no coat or their hair is disheveled or their, their, their clothes is too small. It's oftentimes easy to look at people and to see their needs and it's, it clues in. Or someone walks up and they have a very, very bad odor. It's easy to say, oh, I know what their need is. But church, there's oftentimes other needs besides just physical needs. That if we're going to serve people, we got to know what their, what their emotional needs are. What are their spiritual needs? And church, as we pray, we need to pray, praying, Lord, make me conscious to what is going on around me. Make me conscious to what's going on in our church. Help me to see, dear Lord. Open my eyes to see. But not only... Are we to be conscious? I notice in this story that we are also need to be have compassion. If we are going to serve God and serve others, we must have compassion. In the story, we read this word, these words. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Unlike the Levite or the priest, the Samaritan was not only conscious of what was going on, he had compassion. Now, church, we know the history of the Samaritans and the Jews in this time. We understand that there was a great strife between these groups of people and there was a great separation. And the Jews did not like the Samaritans, and, and more than likely this man was Jewish, and the Samaritan comes along and he sees this, 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 this person of a different culture, of a different background, from something that's totally different from me. And I see him bleeding. It's one thing to be conscious of him, but it's another thing to have compassion for him. Oh, so many things are going through my mind right now, Pastor Fry, that I could say, church, with compassion. That as I look at Facebook and I see posts of things, and it's wonderful to have strong convictions and hard feelings. But can I tell you that sometimes, oftentimes, behind some of those things and some of those people we choose to, to make a mark at and take a shot at, they're a person that has a heart and a soul. Right. And we have been called to be compassionate, Amen. to serve other people. Though they may look different, they may act different, God has called us to be compassionate toward people. But this man, the Samaritan, was willing to look beyond his own differences. And he's willing to see that there was a human being there. If not for the grace of God, friend, there go I. Let's be honest, church. How often times have we been down in Indianapolis and we walked down the sidewalk and we perhaps had a man walk up to us that very, looks very, very tattered, disheveled, dirty, and asks us for a dollar. And what's our first thought? Is our first thought, oh, I have compassion. Or is the first thought, it's, this is disgusting. I'm talking, let's be honest, this morning. Right. Amen. And I'm talking to myself this morning. Or, or the woman holding a sign and we'll work for food. And we want to say, well, just get a job. But God has called us to have compassion. People that look different and act different and, and go through life differently. How about the drug addict or abuser? Friends, we've been asked to show compassion. 
Compassion is more than just some emotional feeling. Compassion is seeing someone else with a need and being willing to do whatever we can to help that person with his or her need. Not just because they deserve it, but because God has put us in a place that we can help them. Oh, I don't know if your silence is because you're really upset with me this morning. I'm talking about serving other people. Compassion is not just an emotional feeling, but is a conscious act of our will. It is a conscious act of our will. It is a decision on my part to serve the needs of other people, regardless to how I may feel. But even if that Samaritan would have been conscious of, his need, of this man's needs, and even if he would have had compassion, friends, that would have not been enough. You know, I can stand back and I can look at the world and I can look around at people and I can go, oh, I'm conscious. And boy, am I moved, Brother Seth, with, with all the, that's going on. Church, that's still not enough. You see, the third thing that we must be willing to do, my friend, is the third thing is we must be willing to make contact. Contact. Verse 34 states, he went to him. He just didn't look and was conscious. Oh, he just wasn't moved. He went down right to where he was. And he had contact. You know, a better word, and we, I want to be careful here, is, is oftentimes we think it has to be contact. And sometimes we think, oh, Brother Gene, don't ask me to have contact. I'm not a hugger. But Lord, if you make me, I'll do it. <laughs> Lord, I'll do it for you. Maybe another word that we should use there, but the problem is it's not a C word. Is involvement. God wants us to get involved. I, as I look around and I see people in our church, and as I look around and I see needs in my community, it's one thing to be conscious of it. It's another thing to have compassion. But we've been called to get involved, church. We've been called to do something. We've been called to, to not sit in our seats and sit in our homes and to shut our doors and look at our windows at these people or drive down the street and say, oh, look how sorry I am for those people. But God has called us to get involved and to have contact and to do something, to move out and to take action. The Samaritan saw that there was a need and he moved out and he moved out and he touched and he had contact. Do you know one of the things, not until I began to study this, the scripture. Now think about it, church. Some of the impact, the, the impact of Jesus' ministry. And I, I don't want to say some of it had more impact than others. Because I think all of it had great impact. But think in the stories that oh, so often move us emotionally. And, and oftentimes had some, if I can say, great impact. It was when Jesus touched the people. When he touched people. Yes, when he spoke and he preached. But when he went out and he saw the person that was blind and he touched them. Or the person with leprosy and he touched them. Or the person when they were carrying the, the coffin of the young man and no one else. It was a dirty, that was considered dirty and clean. But Jesus was willing to go and to touch. Or the high priest's mother when she was sick with fever. She was a woman after all. Men didn't touch and didn't do these types of things. She was considered unclean. But when Jesus went and touched, think of the impact that it had when he was willing to get involved personally in the lives of individuals. Church, God wants us to get out of our pews. He wants us to get up and he wants us to start having some contact. He wants us to start getting involved. He wants us to start getting perhaps our hands a little bit dirty. Ouch. Brother Jean, you got me in mind. No, I don't have you in mind. I have myself in mind this morning. I'm thinking about myself this morning and how much have I been willing to serve other people? A lot of times I want to sit back and I want to be conscious and I want to, I want to have compassion. But when it comes to this thing called involvement, 
when it means that I've got to touch, when I've got to get my hands in there, it's a way different church. But God has called us not only to be conscious, he has not only called us church to have compassion and have contact, but the fourth thing that he has called us to do. Now, don't say, Brother Gene, you've already said this one. Because it's a little bit different, and that is he has called us to care. And there's difference between compassion and caring. Compassion is oftentimes is an emotion, and caring is oftentimes putting that compassion to motion and into work. We read in verse 34, He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. If I am going to truly care for a person, then I need to first determine the real need of that person. This is what the Samaritan did. When someone has a physical need, that's pretty easy to discern, but being able to meet that need. It is a lot harder when it comes to emotional or spiritual needs, church. This is why it's important that we have the contact. We get in there. We get to know. You see, that, that compassion compels us to get out there. And once we make that contact and we spend some time and get involved, then we really know how to care for that person. It's not my agenda what I think people need. It's truly serving people where they are and meeting their needs right where they are. The more time I spend with the person, the greater chance or the likelihood I will be able to discern people's needs. Caring about a person involves more than just getting them saved. You say, Brother Gene, this is a church you're supposed to worry about. I do worry about getting people saved. But can I tell you something, church? That sometimes before we can get people saved, sometimes we've got to also meet their physical needs, their emotional needs. And we've got to be willing to step out and help someone else. And even when they do get saved, we can't just leave people. We've still got to be there to help them, support them, give people what they need. This is what we've been called to do, church. We've been called to serve. You have been called to serve. I have been called to serve. Now, what are you doing? What are we doing? That's for Brother Paul Fry. He's got that kind of in his blood. Whew, yeah, that's what it is. I'll give money to we care so he can do it. No, church. That's not what it said. It didn't say in the Bible. Give it to Brother Paul Fry. No, 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 don't, 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 don't give it to Pastor Fry. It's not just all his work. Not just Pastor Davis or, or Pastor Joey. Church, it's all of our responsibility to reach out and to serve one another. To care. But Brother Gene, this isn't my talent. I don't have this kind of talent. This is not my gifts. Church, God wants to do something with us. And he wants to stretch you. And can I tell you something? And a lot of times maybe you're thinking right now, Brother Gene, you're thinking about all these different ministries that we have out here, the jail ministry or this, the, the, this men's ministry that Brother Paul's getting started here or, or we, we care. You, we're thinking that. But church, can I stop for just a minute? Look around this church at how many people's here. You know, there's, there's a lot of ministry right here serving one another. And opportunities just to be able to look across the church and find out what one another needs and serve one another. Finding a brother or sister that's having a bad day and just after church letting God speak to you. And as he speaks to your heart and shows you someone, walk up to them and put your arm around them. And say, I'm praying for you. You want to talk about being conscious, having compassion, contact, caring? That's all those things right there. And how much did it really take of your time? How much did it cost you? But when we start letting God show us and work through us, when we can be caring for one another, my friends, this is what God has called us to do, is to serve. The fifth and final cost, final thing is cost. 
it's cost. The fifth C is cost. We read here in the scripture, and the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. When the Samaritan stopped and was willing to serve, he incurred several costs. It cost him his time. It cost him his effort and energy. It cost him resources, his oil and his wine. And it cost him something financially. And when we choose to serve people, church, there's going to be some cost on our part. And that's where a lot of people's not willing to give up. I'm not willing to give some cost to it. But church, there's five things. We've got to be willing to pay the cost. My prayer this year, church, has been that God would take me. I did not know about this sermon. I did not know about this message. But this year, as my prayer has been, I, I try to every year, Lord, help me to have a focus this year, something. And this year, for some reason, God laid it on my heart. And I thought, Lord, I want to be your hands. Lord, I want to be your feet. I want to be your eyes. I want to be your ears. I want to be your mouth. Lord, I just want to be your life. Wherever you want me, whatever you want me to do, Lord, I want to be willing to do that. You know, that is an easy prayer to pray. But I'm finding that's a hard prayer to live. And I'm being completely honest this morning, church. That is hard. That is hard to live when God starts asking you to do some things that you've never done before. And to step out and do some things that I don't feel comfortable doing. That's hard. Can I give you, I prayed this prayer this year. And so then, then, lo and behold, then I take this mission trip. And God began to, to talk to me on this trip that we took to Guatemala. I remember the one night that we took, we went to the, the, the revival. Close to two to three hundred people were there that evening. And they came up and they asked Dr. Fry and I if we would give a testimony. Now, folks, you know me. I don't have a problem talking to people and in front of large crowds. But for some reason, this particular night, as soon as they told us, a fear gripped me like I have never had before. And as Dr. Fry and I walked up, he looked over me and he says, do you want to go first? And I said, no. No, I'll let you go first. But the entire time he was given a testimony and having it interpreted, I was shaking, Dr. Fry. I was scared to death, and I thought, why in the world are you so nervous? You'll never maybe see these people again, and if you do, they don't understand you anyway. What's it matter? But a fear, and I thought, kept thinking to myself, all of a sudden this thought came, why in the world are you doing this? And God says, Jean, haven't you been praying that you could be my lips? Oh, yeah. He says, just let me use you. Let me just, just give your testimony. And, and we gave our testimony. We sat down and, and serve, after service was over, Dr. Fry went off and Pastor Marcus went off and that left the rest of us who doesn't speak any Spanish standing there. And of course, people want to come up and talk to you and take your pictures. Uh, and, and these two men came up to us and Jessica, I don't know if you remember that or not, but the two men came up to us, and they, and they started, they were trying to talk to us, and, and the best I could do is I could say, Connor, Connor, he's got three years of Spanish, and he's going, oh, no, 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 no Spanish. <laughs> and finally, they found someone that could interpret to us, and they, these men says, we want you to know what an encouragement it was for us tonight, your testimonies, and that you would come and worship and travel that many miles down here and just simply worship with us. And I thought, oh God, I didn't do anything. But God, I'm just asking you to be, use my lips, use my body, use my hands, use my feet, use me, whatever. And I'd never imagined that it, me giving a little testimony or us just simply being in a service worshiping and not understanding a thing in that service, that God could use us, just simply use us. I thought of the, the clinic that we did, and, and I did not let anyone in our group know this. 
that when we did this clinic, it always sounded so fun. The closer that clinic time came, I began to get scared, Brother Dowler. A fear, I am not kidding you, I can remember that morning, we were in, I was in our room. It was dark that morning, and I began to think, Lord, what in the world am I doing? You all would have to understand a little bit of who I am is that is, I've got to be in control, okay? I've got to have all the answers if someone asks me. I've got to know all the solutions. And it suddenly hit me, Dr. Fry, what if someone walks in and I don't know what to do? What am I going to say? What am I going to do? I can't do this, I don't think. And I thought, and God says, Gene, didn't you pray that you would be my hands and you'd be my feet and you'd be my lips? Yes, Lord. He says, then let me do it. Let me, let me be in your hands and let me be in your feet. And that, that morning, as we began to work in that clinic there, the first couple of patients we had, Jessica and I, were together, and that made me feel a lot better. The next thing I knew, she turned around and she was gone. She was gone, and she was outside taking care of people, and she was sending them to me. And I remember this one young lady came in, and she sat down, and she was three months pregnant. Now, folks, that's not my specialty. <laughs> oh, Lord, not OB. But as she, she sat there, and she looked at me, and she said, I'm three months pregnant. And she pulled out her pregnancy test to show me. I believe you. <laughs> she says, I have three kids at home. And she says, my husband has just left me. She says, I want to die. There was nothing that we had on the table that I could give her. There was nothing in school that they trained me for this situation. And suddenly I felt as though God says, I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. And all I could do that morning was simply say, can I tell you something? Jesus cares. Jesus knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're facing. And you know, church, that is what the world needs. Is sometimes we think, I can't do it. I don't have the skills, and I don't have the abilities, and I can't preach, and I can't sing, and I can't go through that jail ministry. I have never, ever done anything like that before. But I thought recently, Brother Gilbert, when I heard about you going, and how you never imagined that you would be standing there sharing the gospel but God put you in a place, and I'm sure that he was beginning to stretch you. It wasn't comfortable at the time. And you know, I thought, God, you put me on a mission field in the middle of nowhere with a woman that's pregnant. I'm not comfortable, Lord. But God, here, make me your hands, make me your feet. In church, I'm thinking of people here today. God wants to take every single one of us, and he wants us to do something for him. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager. It doesn't matter if you're a kid. It doesn't matter if you're a young adult. It doesn't matter if you're middle-aged or older. God has something for all of us. And God has called us all to serve. It's not going to be out on the mission field, maybe. It may not even be in the jail. It may simply be right here in this church. You might be the person who is the encouragement. You might be getting people's cell phone numbers. And when God puts them on your heart, you text them and say, I'm praying for you. That sounds silly, Brother Gene. Oh, that's not silly. You don't know how many times that I have been blessed by just simply getting a text when someone says, I'm praying for you. And they don't know exactly what's happening and where I'm going. Brother Seth, you've texted me before and you've sent me those messages. And he, little did he know what was going on in my life right now, right then and there. But he is willing to be conscious. He's willing to be compassionate. He's willing to make contact. He's willing to care. He's willing to take a cost. And you know, church, God is calling us all to serve. Amen. There's not a single one of us that's left out. Are you willing? You see, God says that the Father, when we serve, the Father will honor us. Church, we've all been called to serve. And I pray that as I preach this morning, maybe God's laid someone on your heart or something on your heart. And you say, I don't think I can do it. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. You can't do it. Because God wants to do something in your life that you can't do. 
He wants to do something and prove in you and through you it's all him. That's exciting. It's scary. Church, let's stand. Can I challenge you? Serve the Lord this week. Ask God what he wants you to do. How he wants you to serve. How he wants, what's he want you to do? Maybe there's something that, that God has been laying on your heart that he's been wanting you to do. Maybe something that not even is happening in this church. Can I tell you something? Would you go to the Dr. Fry or Sister Fry, if you ladies, or, or myself or one of us, and, and come and talk to us? You say, it just seems just ridiculous. But if God's laying it on your heart, church, then you better do it. Maybe there is a ministry that you, you need to be part of. And something you say, I have never imagined that I could do that. Come and talk. God wants to do something. You say, well, I've not been a Christian very long. Can I tell you something? If you've not been a Christian very long, you better get plugged in and start doing something. You say, God's called you to do it too. And if you've been serving the Lord for a long, long time and you've not been serving, you better start. There is a place for all of us, church. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to serve you. But Lord, our prayer is that you would help us as a church, dear Lord. We've seen so much going on. And Lord, you've been doing so much in this church, dear Lord, with so many people. But Lord, you want us all to take part of your kingdom. You want us all to take part of the service. And Father, our prayer is this morning, you would help each and every person, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that is in this church, church and those that are watching on the internet dear lord no matter their age no matter their abilities dear lord we pray father you'd challenge each and every one of us show us what we are to do dear lord help us to serve dear lord for lord when we serve dear lord we are not serving ourselves. we're not serving this church lord we are serving you dear lord and we're bringing glory we're bringing honor whether it be big or whether it be small father help us this morning Help us to find our place and help us to do it. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you.